Well, welcome to the session uh, on digital uh, library, digital registry. Uh, I have just the perfect people on the panel for what I'm hoping to do. Uh, so I'll just move ahead with it. Uh, I'd like to introduce the topic a little bit and then engage in a dialogue with the uh, panelists about it. I feel that this topic responds in a very direct way to the concern expressed in the feedback looking for an action item, a place to start. That's very much the way I think of this. I got started myself as a character in the internet space when back somewhere around 1990 I assumed the identity of Eon, the Dean of Cyberspace. This had a certain comic character to it, and yet it was for me never truly comic. It was actually conceptual. My background is in mathematics, and I was thinking about cyberspace from the beginning like a mathematical set the set consisting of bits. And at the beginning, of course, this was a null set. There was nothing. But then with the Internet's creation, suddenly there starts to be a populated set of bits. And you could see this bit set grow. And you could explore in that space. You could use that space for anything you could find in it. At a given point in the growth of that space, imagine it as a set of bits, I felt copyright intrude. And copyright intruded in a way that contaminated, by my lights, every bit in the space. Because you couldn't tell one bit from another as far as copyright was concerned. But by using a bit, you made yourself subject to the threat of litigation. Now, Terry made a simple map on the board yesterday, where he had public domain on one side, and then he had a nice, broad mess of chalk in the middle, which was disputed space. And he had copyright on the other side. Well, I think thinking in terms of these maps is extremely useful. But let's just parse them out more carefully. You take this bit space, and you identify in it four kinds of bits, four categories of bits for purposes of our thought. One are public domain bits defined as usable bits. You can use them for anything. They're ours. We are free to use those bits. All right, then there are three other categories. There is, way over on the other side, the copyright, all rights reserved, lockdown, industry labeled bits. There they are, you've got to pay to use them. And there are two categories in the middle. In fact, both of these categories are in the midst of Terry's mess. They are the orphan works, the bits that are copyrighted, but you can't find out how to get permission. And they are Creative Commons bits. That is, bits which ostensibly come with a permission but the problem is you can't trust it. How do you know that the Creative Commons label that's affixed to the thing you're about to use actually represents the legal permissions that it purports to represent? How do you know who even put the label on there? So in terms of a user perspective, 
from the point of view of the von Hippel world, you might say. That is, the world of people who want to use what's there. That's the map. All right, now, we're going to talk today about digital libraries, digital registry. First off, Terry, does the proposition make sense to you that if you're going to have a sensible regime of intellectual property law, that it cries out to be based on a registry, that this idea that if you have a sensible system of land, it only works with a registry, by parallel thought, when you come to the world of ephemeral property, it only makes sense to build a digital permissions regime on a digital registry of the property. Does that make sense to you? Good. All right. Come up a little closer to the microphone. Yes, definitely. There are all sorts of advantages that come with, uh, if there are going to be uh, assertions of rights as to things, knowing what those rights are and who asserts them. So. Uh, it's going to be an odd example, but uh, some years ago I was giving some advice to uh, governments in Central America about real property systems. And uh, it turns out that one of the most serious problems of conflicting um, the principal six Central American countries is nobody knows who owned what land. Um, this had some uh, predictable adverse consequences in which uh, you couldn't get uh, a loan to build a house or to establish a business because uh, the banks wouldn't uh, uh, advance any money because they couldn't rely on the quality of the title which you would assert in the property as collateral. So it included economic development. It also had other less obvious disadvantages. In, uh, exemplified not in Central America, but in Peru, where a, a similar effort to establish a registry um, dramatically increased the number of girls going to school. Uh, why? Uh, no one expected this, but the answer is that in the absence of clear property rights in the crowded cities in Peru, um, a family felt obliged to leave one member home during the day to uh, assert ownership, uh, because otherwise there was some risk of being ousted by a squatter and then being unable to oust the squatter. And so who's going to say no? It's the, it's the girls and the family. So uh, there are many economic and social advantages to knowing who owns what. So if there are going to be assertions of right in the digital space, it's essential that we have a better system for knowing who owns what. Good. All right. So we then start with a kind of an agreement that the idea of a registry, a comprehensive registry of intellectual property, if it's to be the basis of people asserting rights and permissions and so forth, makes sense. It then evolves to an engineering and design problem. How do we build this? Well. You might first think, oh my god, this is impossible. There's just so much intellectual property, it's almost infinite. And so at one point, almost a year ago now, I assembled a group of engineers at Stuart Schieber's shop over in computer science and talked about the difficulty of building a database of intellectual property. And I basically got blown off by the engineers. They said, look, we build a registry of the stars. It's not a problem of size. That's like, come on. The problem that you guys have got building the database 
is that the person who programs the database has got to be given clear instructions into which boxes what goes, which means that you lawyers have got to figure out the rules that you want us to program into the box. So there's an engineering problem that is a function of how complicated the different domains of copyright are to capture in an engineering sense. At the moment in the world, there is movement towards digital registries. It's been active from the highest levels of copyright, WIPO, the big companies are seeing the need for this. But they've also run into the problems of having to agree on just what the rules are, and they find that that is horrendously difficult. So now, John Palfrey, would you describe for the audience your Digital Library of America project. And would you, in the course of describing it, be thinking about the difficulties of coming to terms on what would go into a registry clearly enough so that you could program it for the four categories of bits that we're talking about, public domain, Creative Commons, Orphan Works, outright clear copyright with just how to do it. I would um, be happy to. Uh, it's a long story, so I don't want to take up the whole session with it. You should cut me off where it um, deserves to be cut off. But the basic concept is, um, I think from the beginning of the thinking about the internet, you were certainly involved and many others in this room, um, have thought about the idea that we could create, roughly speaking, a digital library of Alexandria, that one of the great promises of the internet would be to make available um, the full cultural, scientific, historical record of mankind in um, this uh, space that you are uh, discussing. And um, I think that dream has been pursued a number of times in a number of ways without success. Um, and I think we actually have the traction around a version of that right now in the form of something called the Digital Public Library of America Project. And the idea is um, not for any one institution to do it, but to establish a community of people. I think of it very much akin to Wikipedia in a way. Um, a community of people who are working on pieces of this. Jeffrey Schnapp has a great example. Stuart Schieber has another. Um, all the different universities that are scanning our collections as examples, all of the public libraries that are scanning their collections, the local historical societies that are or could scan their collections, to put them into a common space, um, and then to allow on an open basis for libraries to take these materials and to make uh, local collections from them. To do so on the basis of open code as well, so uh, a number of uh, organizations have helped already to um, code through the beta sprint you represented before, set of um, uh, open code that could be used to uh, take these materials and make them available broadly to the public, um, an open set of metadata so that the records, um, the catalog records, for instance, that we create um, could be shared freely uh, among these different libraries as well as other metadata about the information, um, uh, little tools and services as well. We know that librarians don't necessarily have everywhere the skill to be able to create a digital library. I love the idea in particular of a Scanabago, the idea that you get a Winnebago and drive it around the country um, and bring it to a local historical society somewhere and say, bring out your scans. And you'd have them come and uh, digitize a series of key records important to this local, uh, local area, which would then be put into the, um, this public commons, but also accessible locally. Um, in such a way that maybe nobody would ever access it outside of Darien, Connecticut, if that's where you were. Um, but maybe, actually, historians might like to look across 100 small towns at a certain point in history and so forth. And then last, it would be a strong community of people who would be working on this. And I think, actually, one of the ways that the community might be relevant is exactly in the context of the registry. Um, I had been thinking of roughly in three zones, but I'll work with your, your four zones. Um, it's plain that we could do this today with public domain materials. This is not a hard premise. So 
Harvard has uh, hundreds of thousands of images alone that are in the public domain, whether they're books or um, uh, pictures or audiovisual materials, that we could put into the DPLA today, and likewise others. And there's no particular constraint other than money and time and so forth. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, plainly things in copyright um, would be highly restricted in this environment that I'm talking about. So a new book that Scott Bradner writes, um, immediately uh, held in copyright, some combination of him and his publisher, that would be very hard to put in a public domain um, uh, space like this and have any library lend it. And there's a very large discussion about what e-lending is, is allowed in the context of digital materials. Um, I want to put a little footnote there, which is it might be that we could scan it and do certain things with it. Libraries, turns out, have particular privileges under the Copyright Act. And one question is whether or not it would be lawful for us to scan Scott's new book, put it in this digital library, and allow libraries, for instance, only to, um, uh, to relay it to people in certain contexts, for instance, protections for people with disabilities that exist in the law. So set aside whether we could do something with that, but it's plainly severely limited. And then I think of um, the sort of messy gray zone that Terry mentioned, which is a combination, I think, of the orphan works and the, those materials um, uh, that are licensed, but where you might not want to rely on license. My view is I would rely on the Creative Commons licenses. I think we should lean into this. It was created here. We should believe in it and, uh, and go with it. Um, the orphan works are, are trickier, of course. Um, I think you could take some risk with respect to orphan works. Um, but I think absent clear title and, and legislation, that's a tricky zone. Now, there are projects, as you have uh, noted, um, that seek to put things from one, or take things from one zone and put it to the other. So it's a wonderful project based out of Michigan through the Hathi Trust Project. And it's basically designed to free things from that middle zone and put them in the public domain zone. So the idea is they have a large number of people and some grants who are working through materials that have been digitized and trying to establish plainly that they belong in the public domain versus otherwise. And I think your registry idea uh, underlies that, that concept, that if we had a community devoted to this Digital Public Library of America idea, and where the, instead of being Wikipedians creating new articles, what they were doing was creating the metadata that in fact freed up materials to make them free to all in this Digital Public Library of America, I could easily see that pathway as a great way to activate people uh, around the world potentially in, in this particular way. All right, now I want to add a, another dimension into this. The feature of the space that's polluting is the threat of litigation. That's what you're trying to fend off. And one of the problems with litigation is that its resolution is not always based on the merits. It's often based on the bargaining situation where when the suit is brought, the lawyer of the institution that's being sued is put in a defensive position where the best thing to do is to pay off or sign off or take it, when in doubt, take it out. The whole threat of litigation is really the forward arm of copyright and used very aggressively. Whereas we could say the same in the patent area, but all right, we're talking copyright here. So that the objective of the registry that I think is needed is not merely a registry, but a legally defensible and legally defended registry. So that the proposal that I'm putting forth is one which calls for a collaboration between the libraries that you're describing and the great law firms of the world. So, for example, let's take the public domain as the starting point. You say, we could do that right away. We don't need anybody's permission. We've got it. It's all, we could do that. We don't have it all yet scanned and so forth. There's right, a lot yes, of work yes, and a lot of stuff to, to be done. Yes, yes, yes. But, but the threat public of litigation domain. is not a sort of Damocles above our head in right. this particular respect. So now, Jeffrey, I want to come to you as a curator. When you talk about curating things, you're really talking about discriminating, making choices. And if you, 
collaborating on a library curatorial project were to be joined by, let's say, pro bono legal help. You could be confident, do you think, in curating public domain works, including the declaration of public domain status? Well, it's a, um, uh, not just as a curator, but as somebody who, um, who writes books. Uh, and I have, and who has a particular appetite for um, all nooks and crannies of the historical record that pass unobserved, which is to say a world that is uh, uh, very much in Terry's gray zone, where most of the, uh, the objects that I'm interested in working with, citing, reusing, uh, are orphaned or abandoned in some form or other. Uh, I can tell you that the, the notion of some kind of transparent and, uh, mechanism, uh, whether it's as a curator in the physical sense or as a digital curator or as an author to me is, is really a fundamental realm of freedom that I could only dream of because most of the time I have my own views about how aggressively issues of intellectual property should be confronted, but they are always at odds with every publishing house, every museum, every inter institutional interlocutor, uh, certainly the uh, general counsel of every university I have ever taught at. Uh, and of course, as a practicing scholar, uh, the lesson that you derive from that experience is don't ask, do, <laughs> because you can only change the culture in your own small way by adopting such a stance. Otherwise, you become a prisoner of uh, essentially a kind of labyrinthine world where um, you, sh you would have to dedicate yourself full time to permissions issues rather than to critical thinking or uh, historically grounded research. Uh, and you know, for me, this issue, the issue of the library as an institution is really a, an issue that has a very deep history in the sense that you know, libraries, as I'm sure uh, m most of you are well aware, have been institutions of privilege over the course of their history. They, they were largely built as institutions around a priesthood. Uh, and that priesthood uh, had privileged access to the sets of resources of which they were the guardians and the custodians. It is thanks to that priesthood that we have the cultural record in a sense. At the same time, one of the great adventures of the modern era, the era that created the property system that we're, we're, we're talking about here, has involved the substitution, the gradual substitution of that figure of the priest with the citizen in some form or another. In other words, a kind of democratization of access to forms of knowledge. And I think where the Digital Public Library of America project resonates for me really powerfully is, I think it has the potential to really complete that process of democratization in a, in a really radical way that goes far beyond the sort of state at which it exists in physical libraries. And John alluded to one of the dimensions of that, which is, of course, that of how certain forms of local knowledge, like local history, bodies of knowledge that no research library would ever comprehend or include in its collecting practices. Collecting practices are always practices of exclusion in some fundamental <laughs> set of ways. Uh, and, and they have to be, because the project of total inclusion is a project that already in the 17th and 18th centuries seemed unimaginable to bring to full fruition. Not to mention, once you look at the exponential growth of forms of publication, of categories of objects uh, uh, that, that now have become objects of collection, uh, in short, that there is no such thing as the universal library. So what does the digital add as value to this conversation? I think it is this possibility of a world of, uh, that's user-centered rather than priest-centered, if you like, where ordinary citizens are the archivists, the, the journalists, the historians. Uh, uh, and that doesn't eliminate the possibility for expertise and forms of expert knowledge. On the contrary, it, it enriches them. It places them in uh, contact with a, a, an audience where models of quality can uh, speak to a much broader population. So in, try, in terms of trying to realize that vision, the question of copyright is, of course, a central question because it is the single obstacle that stands in the way of the kind of freedom that I was assuming in that scenario I was describing. Um, and the, the most palpable example I can offer just for my conversation here is uh, 
the paradoxical boom in late Victorian studies that Google Books has given rise to. I mean, late, you know, the Victorian era may not be the period that you follow with the greatest uh, level of attention, but um, the fact that the the record uh, the um, that Google Books is biased towards knowledge that was produced before 1923, okay, produces some interesting effects. Um, in many of the social sciences, which were born in the late 19th century, um, fields like sociology and psychology, social psychology, um, those are fields that are not very interested in excavating their own history. Typically, there is not a historian of sociology on the faculty of a sociology department, or it's rare. Uh, in psychology, people are focused on contemporary experimental practices. Um, so all this dirty laundry that's the story of the genesis of these disciplines, is now so widely available that there's been an upsurge in um, uh, historical work on the genesis of these fields. Now that's, of course, a, a, happy, a happy outcome, but wouldn't it be a happier outcome if the borderline between knowledge that was freely available and where, for instance, computational tools could be used even to do things with that knowledge that couldn't be done with conventional forms of access didn't stop in 1923, for instance. Um, so for me, this question is a question that's very right, much at the heart of the question of the, the role that power plays in channeling and limiting models of access. Uh, um, the copyright system, as I have experienced it myself, is enforced as a function of who you are and what kind of heft you have. I just am in the process of surviving a battle with a, a paperback publisher who bought the rights to reprint Marshall McLuhan's The Medium is the Massage and several other Marshall McLuhan book, books about which I've written a book, which is a history of the experimental paperback of the late 1960s and early 70s. It was an attempt to create a kind of television age, first cybernetic age version of the paperback, to reinvent the book for the television era. These are books that are made out of cut and, they are cut and paste books using other books. They are remixes of public material. And yet, both the, uh, apparent owners of the copyright and the republisher of the volumes who have permission only to reprint are invoking their claims on this material which itself was remixed by the authors of the book. Um, and you can see the kind of labyrinth that somebody who's an end user, now the nature, I just to conclude, conclude here, uh, the nature of my book is about the ways in which forms of visual argument become just as central to the logic of a text as verbal argument. To, to show that, I need to show thumbnails of the graphic logic of a book, page by page by page. These are short paperbacks, 128 page paperbacks. Um, the fight we got into immediately was an objection that that compromises the product. These are thumbnails that are, you know, thumbnail size. That that compromises the contract between the publisher, the republisher of the book. Um, and, uh, and, and therefore, uh, we were immediately, sub my, uh, my collaborator who's a graphic artist and I were subject to the threat of a lawsuit uh, um, that initiated at the New York Book Fair uh, with the publisher storming out of the room screaming that his team of lawyers would be knocking on our door next. Um, you can see the problem. There's, there's knowledge that is compromised by my not, being, my not being able to do anything except point to the ubiquitous copies of these very texts that exist on the internet, but in an illegal space. Hmm. All right, so now let me put where we've gotten so far together into the form of uh, a coherent action proposal that is coming onto the table. The idea is to aspire to build a comprehensive intellectual property registry. The idea is to see it as an engineering program problem first and to start with what we can do, what is within our capacity to do, both because we have the material, we have the rights, we have the resources. There's nothing that stops us. That's something that we could do to establish our freedom in this space. And I think of it completely as an act to establish, to build freedom in the space. We are building the cyberspace and we are building freedom into it by clarifying bits and legally defending them, setting them up in a way that's legally defensible. 
So I then ask you to imagine a kind of fast forward in which this has happened. We have, let's imagine, a substantial group of the digital public libraries of America acting to curate their collections of public domain materials, but only those that are impeccably in the public domain, as determined in collaboration with esteemed legal associates and with pro bono lawyers willing to defend the declarations so that these are truly reliable. <coughs> Imagine that that database then exists. That then becomes a, a competitive environment to the contaminated environment. And just the kinds of things that Jeffrey's talking about with Victorian literature starts to happen. All right, now, Terry. If you imagine that there is a functioning, legally defended public domain registry for public domain works, and outside of it there is the body of Creative Commons creators and would-be users if they were only sure, and yes, John, you'll use Creative Commons, but the commercial investor who's about to you know, it doesn't want that lawsuit to come and stop them. You, you, you may be able, the, the sense I'm looking for is the desire of the creative common creator to get their work into the registry in a way that the registry would accept, where the, where the requirement for entry to the registry is legal reliability of the registration. I don't, and I don't mean to limit you to Creative Commons. I'd actually love to test the wonderful range of your knowledge. What other works would you see as an engineering matter and legal matter would be the next works to introduce into this defended, zone of free bits, of, of clearly usable bits. How about government publications? In the United States, you don't have to worry about that because they're all in the public domain. <coughs> so we could feed them right into this registry, no problem. Well, that's one of the few things in which as to which a registry is not particularly valuable because it's a established principle in the United States, not in all countries. And not in all states, right? So only U.S. government works. Uh -huh. <coughs> so uh, let, let me t take up a few of the issues here. Yes, good. Speaking of the question you first wanted to. Um, so first suggestion, in an effort to be one stop. <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> To contribute to the concrete project. Yes, yes. It's a very good idea. Okay. So first suggestion is, uh, um, I don't think it's, uh, it makes sense to aspire, as you put it, to a uh, comprehensive registry. Uh, this is one distinction between uh, land and the cyberspace. So, uh, land is finite, so I, uh, and the cultural products, as a practical matter, are infinite. And you will never map at all. So. Um, that recognizing that it echoes through the design. Okay, next suggestion: um, it will it, your chances of um, partial success grow to the extent you can um, make it a dis distributed project. Distributed, not just in the sense that you're not going to have a single Fort Knox holding all the records; they're going to be distributed across all <coughs> institutions. But distributed in the more fundamental sense, in which um, if the registry is built by people who have an interest in um, filing, it'll grow much faster and more effectively than if it relies upon the, John and his teams to locate sets of material, catalog and curate them and put them in. So if you can make it in the interest of people to say uh, either this is mine or I donate this to the public, or 
in the intermediate case. Here's what the right side is certain, here's the right side don't. It'll grow much faster. Uh, next practical suggestion, I think this sort of is the link, is um, I think your idea, I think it's your idea, of enlisting law firms to defend the um, assertions of um, permission uh, is a very good one, but uh, it ought to be supplemented with an insurance idea uh, because just charging the associates who are going to do this work in the law firms with the responsibility to defend willy-nilly every uh, document against attack it doesn't make sense because those associates are going to show up and they're going to say, actually, this one's clearly owned by Disney. It just you know, it doesn't make sense to you know, fight it. And, uh, and then the person who has relied upon the clip in a remixed documentary of the sort that Jeffrey's team has created, uh, they're going to be told by the associate, hey, give it up. Well, what do you mean give it up? Statutory damages? And you know, it's serious trouble here. You need an insurance function. So I think legal defense and insurance could be married. And in fact, and in fact they're very complementary, aren't they? Because the more effective the legal review is, the more willing an insurance company would be to stand in back of the enterprise. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Um, as is true in the ENO insurers and the patched together semi-private registry of scripts in the movie industry. So there are industries that absolutely need registries, and in the absence of a genuine um, public one, meaning governmental one, they've con contrived their own. And one of those is scripts in the movie industry, and there's an insurance system that backs it up only because of the existence of a Great, let John jump in here. Want to just had a question back to you on this particular score. One of the things that you're asserting, I think, together is that certainty in this respect would be a good thing in the digital space. Um, and I, uh, though I support the idea, I wonder about some of the effects that the certainty might have. So one example would be to bring some law back in, uh, although this is all about law. Um, think about the YouTube um, and Viacom case. So in the context of that case, one of the, um, the delicate issues was whether or not um, YouTube could rely upon the safe harbor in the DMCA um, section 512 um, and uh, how much um, knowledge they um, uh, could have of infringing material on their site and how much of an affirmative approach need they take um, relative to excluding materials that are um, subject to copyright in order to take advantage of the safe harbor. So I wonder, just using that as one example, but of course fair use broadly is yet another, that um, would this higher level of certainty with respect to bits um, in fact preclude some things that one might like? In the case of YouTube, innovation, in the case of Jeffrey, possibly um, fair uses, which is an, obviously a, um, related only insofar as someone might um, not take advantage of rights that they had because of a perception that it was unlawful to do it in this particularly heightened um, space. Well, if I get the question right, it highlights the fact that it's a variation on the proposition that uh, comprehensive coverage is an impossible goal, that even in the ideal state of affairs, there will be clarity as to some things you may do and some things you may not do with respect to a subset of cultural products. But there will be many cultural products that remain uncertain, and then there will be a boundary of things, of, of, of materials even in the registry, as to which you don't quite know what your rights are. Now this returns to Jeffrey's tactic. So Jeffrey is analogous, I'll assert, see if he agrees, to Google. Um, Jeffrey is a professor, now fortunately a professor at Harvard, and uh, those things together dramatically enhance his ability to take risks. Um, and Google is the institutional analog. So Google buys YouTube and moves very aggressively <coughs> in, uh, in an environment that no other um, company could because the potential liability is astronomical. And uh, they are in the process of testing 
the boundaries of this unavoidable gray zone. So I think of Charlie's project, Charlie's worthy project, as shrinking the gray zone, but it, you can't make it go away. So that, in turn, suggests a different role for um, the legal um, participants in this department. One role, as you can think of, is analogous to the traditional function of um, legal aid bureaus and law schools, which is case-by-case -case defense of individual clients. Know, closely analogous to um, defending particular tenants against eviction uh, by invoking the implied warranty. A different role for law firms or uh, lawyers associated with law schools and so forth is um, more in the nature of test cases that would be associated with ventures like Google's or like Jeffrey's, in which my goal is not to um, defend the status of this work, my goal is rather to move the boundary of a particularly important doctrine in a way that clarifies the freedom of people to make uses uh, that are not authorized by their um, putative owners. Uh, so uh, now, this in turn is one of the reasons why I uh, persist in um, the argument that we've been having for a long time, namely the importance of, of retaining attention on that gray area and not limiting one's um, focus to the public domain. Because there's all this stuff, all this important stuff that we ought to um, labor to get as much uh, freedom to use as possible. Otherwise, we're going to be uh, producing um, Victorian studies or <laughs> studies of the progressive era until the Prohibition, now yeah. alive. Yeah. Yeah. Next up, the Depression. <laughs> so now, let me agree with you 100%. I don't even see where a difference has been between us on this. Um, but let me take it in two steps. The first step is build the registry of the impeccably public domain. No, no, no uncertain borders. And recognize that what you're actually building when you're building that is a consortium of the great library institutions of the world advised by the great law firms of the world. That doesn't now exist. And that, that grouping of talents focused on the public domain is a new entry into the lists of how we will organize cyberspace. Now, with that, that unit once in place, Yes, absolutely, it is the next logical thing for any upstanding law firm to want to do, rather than just do defensive litigation against spurious claims, which we hope there won't be many because we so impeccably did it and we're insured anyway, will be affirmative litigation to push the boundaries of freedom. And yes, those parts of the edges of the public domain which are messed up, Fair use, I, you and I have a discussion we still, I would still love to have with this audience about what fair use is and where it comes from and how to think about it. But I completely agree with you that a, a, an institutionally powerful, legally powerful organism of freedom set loose in the public domain to oppose litigation coming from the other side would be a huge plus. Yochai. So that's actually a beautiful yes, crystallization of the opposite of the critique that I saw in Jeffrey's intervention here and in John's last round of question, which is to say, what is the greatest musical library for a moment ever created in human history. We had that in one of the slides earlier, right? It was called Napster. 
It didn't come from institutions that were big and powerful and could actually push back. It came from illegality. Don't ask, do, you say. And that carries through to the difference in design between extramuros and the Digital Public Library of America. It's the difference between designing something that has the plausible defensibility of not infringing because not copying, that nonetheless allows the curation of that which others can take on risks given their size and distribution to put on. Ignoring real public domain, not real public, who cares? Can you get it? Can you rely on getting it? Can I, if I want a piece of music that my kids want to hear, can I rely on being able to go on YouTube and find a recording of Louis Armstrong playing this, that, or the other? Sure. That's the public domain. What about illegality and anarchy as a core foundation of freedom? You and I have to have a conversation about law at some point. <laughs> Go Ken first. Can I, can I just jump in? I'd like to uh, piggyback just for a second on Yochai's point, uh, um, it, it, because this is also a pertinent example. The greatest uh, archive of experiment of sound uh, experimentation with sound as a medium is a website that some of you may be familiar um, uh, named Ubu Web. And uh, when Kara and I were working on the mock-up of the McLuhan, the recorded version of Medium is the Massage. It just happens that they, of course, included this record because it was a strange kind of experiment. And like, how would you turn a paperback into uh, an LP recording? So we downloaded it um, to play around, to, to break it, to chunk it up into sound files and so forth. And then when we started putting it back together, we, we were sending out calls to the Ubu website. And I just assumed, of course, Ubu Web, it's been there for 20 years now. Uh, it's the most complete collection in the world of experiments. Um, of course, they've obtained all the permissions. Well, of course, that turns out not to be the case. So it's yet another example of how the Petrucci Library would be an interesting additional case. <laughs> John, and then I'm going to come to Ken, and then I'm going to open up to everybody. Well, I was going in that direction, yeah. too, which was um, one of the good bits of feedback we got last night was somebody who said, um, uh, could we have a ladder into the conversation? It seems like, in fact, um, one of the ladders is uh, here already in the, um, uh, in the question tool behind us. It's, uh, the conversation started during the context of extramuros and other digital humanities examples. And I think the basic underlying question was, um, by virtue of your approach, which is wonderful um, in lots of ways, um, but where you don't rely on, in fact, um, hosting the image, where you're m merely pointing through to something, you know, what's the sort of prospect of broken links in this world? And I, I, there's a variant of this that, um, that bedevils um, libraries consistently, which is to the extent that we hurtle into this digital um, domain so quickly and rely upon formats that, like the DVD, may last for 10 years, right? Um, or, you know, five and a quarter inch floppy disk or three and a half, whatever it might be, that we have to think a great deal about the interoperability of formats going into the future and so forth. And I think in particular, many of the projects um, that you have, particularly the one, the digital archive one, um, I was really thinking, what is the commitment that you and the team are making to the Japanese people who are relying upon those materials in a truly archival sense, which is, is this that you're going to keep it so long as you know this flavor of HTML works, or we like PDF, or whatever it might be, or is there some other kind of commitment that you're making behind it? Um, and I think this does go to what kind of a system we're building um, when we think about this set of bits that we're constructing together. Are we trying to build something of utter permanence, something that might have the, um, the actuality of law behind it and big institutions that commit to reformat all the time in some fashion? Um, or are we trying to do something that might be like Napster, available briefly and um, potentially wonderful and fleeting, right, in various respects? Um, and it seems to me that question of, of permanence um, is one that you know, brings these two sessions together. Maybe if there are students who were anonymous in here who wanted to jump in, that might be a, that might be a ladder in. Very good. Ken. Um, the part of Charlie's vision that bothers me is the armies of law firms um, for various reasons, one having been a litigator for 25 years. Um, and it seems to me there's an intermediate ground between don't ask, just do, and that is do but tell. And 
building into a notion of a safe harbor. Instead of armies of law firms, I like safe harbors a lot better. So if you could enter into a safe harbor by telling, in other words, when you take something out, you're checking it, you know, you're checking it out, you say what you're going to do with it, and after some period of time, you're good to go. And the way that would have to work would be if there were, you know, you couldn't expect the owner to actually go look, but looking in the example of recordings, you know, you've got ASCAP or all these, you know, you've got these um, proxies for the owners who are in the business of looking out for the rights. So there would have to be some other entity like that that would do that. But anyway, that's my thought. Well, I, I, I don't disparage armies of lawyers. In fact, I feel we have a room full of lawyers who have been kind of looking for a role, and the idea of lawyers in support of the public domain seems to me to be a step in the direction that at least I feel and have felt since we started the Berkman Center that that's what we are. We're lawyers for the public domain, ultimately. We're lawyers for freedom. Seems like a good idea. Well, if there were, okay. Um, maybe if there's a different venue, if, if we had a, a nice special venue for it, where it's with rules and limited damages yeah, and dispute we resolution. Do, we have to do this ourselves, Ken. <laughs> it's like we, the people. All yeah, right, so now, where, 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 where? Right here. Yes, hit the button. I just wanted to follow up on the, on the point that you just made. I mean, Get a little closer, so a little louder. Sorry about that. <laughs> to follow up on the point that you just made, I mean, it sounds sort of to the barely trained um, legal ear that you're talking about applying sort of principles of adverse possession um, to intellectual property. Is that, um, I just wanted to make sure that I understood sort of uh, your perspective and I wonder if you could speak a little bit more to that. No, it's more just, it's something in the gray area and well, actually the adverse possession notion mm. isn't a terrible way of characterizing it. But it's more just uh, whether it's adverse possession or whether it's um, effectively characterizing it as, you know, a, a fair use, you know. I don't know what he's talking about. As a technical matter, there is a contested but still often influential concept under the rubric of fair use called good faith. And uh, manifestations of you know, decent behavior by the defendant go a long way. And uh, so that would be a doctrinal cover for your... I wonder if there isn't another one, a doctrinal cover, which um, would be this notion, as I mentioned before, that libraries have special privileges under the Copyright Act. How does it strike you, the idea that we go ahead and scan the stuff anyway with the knowledge that there will be some uses that are permitted by any library, um, and then simply as a technological matter um, uh, and legal, so through contract, then make um, plain to the libraries taking the material that they may only use it for these particular purposes. So I'm thinking in particular of Section 108, and it's somewhat disputed, admittedly, um, set of protections, and likewise the ability to render materials for uh, the blind. Um, and to start there and to have the permissions expand from there as things get either clarified in the public domain or if somebody has a good faith argument, a good faith argument that for a fair use, for instance, they might be able to take it and use it. So I, it makes perfect sense. Here's a slight gloss on that. Um, Peter Yazzie and Pat Afterheide had a project with respect to documentary films. The idea was that they would clarify and push out the boundary of freedom through identification and articulation of custom. So they went around to a lot of documentary filmmakers and say, what do you understand to be the sets of activities with respect to copyrighted materials that you think ought to be and are, this is intentionally blurred, uh, within the zone of permissible conduct as a documentary filmmaker? And they got a whole bunch of answers and they were remarkably convergent and they published it as a set of best practices for fair use in documentary filmmaking. Notice 
This was custom among the documentary filmmakers. They didn't ask the other side at all. <laughs> Nevertheless, the shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder appearance of the documentary filmmakers has had a lot of oomph. And errors and omission insurers who formerly would not warrant the legality of films that abided by these principles say, well, everybody's doing it, sure, we'll give you an insurance policy. And armed with the insurance policy, the potential litigant said, well, fine, forget it. Uh, so it, it, has, it has had been very effective in expanding the zone of opportunity. So generalizing it from this, um, the Harvard Library has a lot of cloud on its own, but it would have a whole lot more cloud if it were allied with a group of libraries in the United States and other countries that said, OK, here's the zone of what we think is appropriate. And you know, this portion is uh, absolutely clear in section 108. And here is a little bit broader zone that comes within some of the other congested fields. This is the set of activities that we think proper. So this would be the establishment of a enlarged set of opportunities, not through the registration and articulation of the status of the individual works, but through uh, clarifying a, a ban in the gray field. Uh, lawyers would have some role in this, um, but the more important one would be shoulder to shoulder uh, statement and to be clear, it wouldn't just be the, the gray field affected, but also the red field affected, right? Yeah. So. right? So I'd like to abstract from that just up one level. I, I regard Peter and Pat's project as just an elegant project that demonstrates the very idea that we need to help ourselves. It's not a matter of going to the legislature and imagining that somehow we're going to put through some reform copyright legislation against the opposition of industry and everything else. The idea that we actually have capacities to build out this space simply by exercising our collective connectivity in constructive ways, it's like, it's your high's penguin. It's like, we just need to apply it in this legal space to push out the bounds of freedom. And so I am uh, uh, wanting just to leave this with that thought in mind, that as lawyers looking creatively at whatever the core is of this internet field and groping for the ways in which we're going to find and protect freedom into the future, it's, I think, not likely to be a matter of reform legislation by old methods and lobbying activities and having to overcome Larry's corruption in order to get there. I think it's much more a matter of recognizing that we the people is a living concept. The idea that we the people of sovereign citizens is a living concept and that the essence of participation in the net is to recognize our sovereignty and our potential as contributors to make the space free within the environment of the real world in which we live. So thank you very much for joining in this, and I look forward to lunch. Excellent. Thank you.